Clockwork Angels is obviously built around a unifying concept. If you can, talk a little bit about how, as a group, you can reach consensus creatively at early stages. Uh, it, it takes time, uh, and it takes a lot of conversation. Uh, and uh, Alex and I usually get sent some scratch lyrics and initial versions of, of what Neil's thinking in terms of the lyric content. And we talk amongst ourselves, and then I take a, a slightly um, larger role in working with Neil and, and shaping the lyrics so that I understand them, that we're satisfied with them, and that they suit the music that we're writing. So it's a very much a three-way collaboration. You guys are still selling a significant number of albums. Uh, you, your tours do quite well. Um, of course, everyone has seen such a change in the business. I'm wondering how Rush, as a business, has pivoted or adapted in, in recent years. You know, it's been a really interesting time for us. The industry has changed a lot, as you pointed out, in, in the last 10 years or 5 years. Uh, but things have changed for us in the last 4 or 5 years as well. We seem to have a lot more, uh, or a lot more exposure. There's a broader audience. Um, the films that have you know, that we've been connected with, uh, the documentary as well as a film like I Love You Man, have br given us a broader appeal. So in some ways we've become more popular in this time when the industry seems to be shrinking a lot more. Yeah, and, and for us, I mean, you can't sell the kind of records that you used to sell. Uh, so what's become more of the important thing is our live tours. and. We're one of those, you know, few bands that has been around for more than three decades. So we've got all this goodwill and this strong fan base. So our tours are more popular than ever. So you know, for a band like us, that you know, is makes more business sense for us to spend more time on the road. In the documentary, you talked about the breakthrough. Uh, the breakthrough you guys had, um, and the fact that it gave you a certain amount of independence, that you were allowed a certain degree of autonomy, or almost well, no autonomy. Well, well um, in early days, um, and, and because of the nature of the way our deal was originally structured, you know, we were kind of signed to our own label in Canada, and then we made a deal with an American label as a kind of production deal, so they get what we produce, with certain caveats, obviously. But um, with the success of 2112, uh, the dogs just stopped barking, you know. And uh, they didn't, when we delivered the record, they didn't really understand it. But the success of the record kind of taught them, well, we don't know what they're doing, but it's working, so <laughs> let's leave them alone. Uh, and we haven't really looked back since then. To bring up the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, of course, you guys have been you know, in the, in the running since 99 or 1998, eligible, I mean. Um, if you are inducted, your fans will be greatly vindicated by, by that. But wouldn't that sort of erase the underdog status that they... <laughs> it's like the Red Sox winning the World Series. Uh, that's okay. We'll, we'll handle that yeah. when it comes along. We'll if, it, if it comes along. I'm, I'm very happy for our fans for this nomination yeah. because... Uh, it means so much to them, and really, it's largely because of them that it's come along. So, mm -hmm. I'm rooting for them. 